Okay. Well, here we go. Uh, welcome everybody to our second week of Behavior Month. Uh, this week is the evolution of enrichment. And uh, we have, again, another special guest, uh, Mark Kingston Jones, who's gonna talk all about enrichment and the evolution of it. And um, for those of you that maybe didn't join us last week, last week was our literally our very first uh, Zoom for Behavior Month. So we're on uh, Zoom 2 and we're learning as we go. So for everybody that uh, participates, let us know uh, what you think at the end. What can we do better next week? What would you like to see or not see? Um, times, do times work or not work? Um, because we definitely want to make this um, accessible to as many people as possible so we can continue to share all of the information. Um, and we have a full hour. Um, so we will have hopefully lots of time for discussion and questions, answers, and all of that good stuff. Uh, throughout the end. But uh, we're going to start by having Mark just talk to us a little bit about enrichment and his experiences with that. So without further ado, Mark, you want to introduce yourself and, and tell everybody who you are? Yes. No. Um, yeah. Thank you, Justin, for inviting me along. And thanks to ABMA for, for setting this all up. This is um, this is awesome. Um, yeah. So uh, my name is Mark. I'm um, the co-founder of Team Building with Bytes, uh, where we basically try and make a living getting other people to pay uh, to make enrichment for us um, through corporate groups, which um, tends to at the moment is working quite well, which we're very happy with. Um, and I'm also um, a facilitator for the Shape of Enrichment as well. Um, which is an international NGO that aims to kind of further enrichment um, with anyone who works with animals who's willing to work with us, essentially. Um, so, yeah, so Justin basically gave me about 10 minutes at the beginning to, to do whatever I wanted. So um, I kind of decided to kind of go along the theme that, well, enrichment should always be evolving, really. Um, we've we've come a long way from where we started, but there's this is a, this is a constant process. We're, we're constantly finding out new things the technology and the kind of the, the 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 materials are constantly changing as well and our animals are always kind of working out ways to to do the challenges that we set them so i kind of wanted to go uh, along that line and um <clears throat> on that line basically um this is not kind of in this is not in isolation um so um i do want to kind of make particular note of uh, my business partner chris hales who is demonstrating the dangers of frayed rope uh, in this picture that's how dedicated he is to animal welfare um but also to um the late valerie Hare, who me and chris wouldn't be where we are without everything um that she taught us and everything that she did for us um and we miss her every single day so um yeah we uh, a lot of this stuff comes from the, the things that we learned from her and we are incredibly grateful for that so from Shape's point of view, from Team Building with Bytes point of view, enrichment, there's lots of different definitions, but for us, it comes down to two kind of key components, um, power and choice. So essentially, we're empowering the animal to control part of its captive environment, and we're offering the choice in if and how they exercise that power. And one of the most difficult things as someone who's you know put a lot of energy and put a lot of passion into creating enrichment is remembering, constantly remembering that ignore is a choice it's a really hard thing when you've put loads of time and loads of energy into kind of convincing your boss or whoever it is who holds the purse strings to give you the time to give you the money to actually you know create this item that you're absolutely convinced is going to change your animal's life forever uh, and you do all that you put all the time in you put all the energy in you put it into the enclosure and your animal kind of comes out and goes nah not today thanks and just walks away um, and that is that is soul destroying. I've had it time and time again. And the kind of the, the temptation is to then bait it or, you know, oh, come on, come over and have a look. It's really fun. It's really exciting. This is going to change your life forever. Um, but the idea of this is that they do this in their own time. It's not something that we should be kind of trying to control because that's that's that is their choice. That is their option to ignore. And hopefully they'll come back and enjoy it later on. So through shape and through bite, we basically try and provide that power and choice by creating holistic and goal-driven enrichment programs that aim for all species of animals in our care and when we say all species we mean all species so you know lobster enrichment is a thing um, and actually if you're kind of into you're kind of geeky into behavior there's some amazing interactions going on here there's some social stuff there's some problem solving um, but you just kind of got to be, be looking out for it it's not the big sexy behavior of a big cat kind of leaping in to grab something and tear it down but 
there's some very interesting stuff going on there. That's awesome. But one, one of the um one of the issues is this whole process of designing and creating. So we use the shape framework, starting off with our research and ending all the way, hopefully, to accepting, is there is a huge amount of work that goes on in the middle. And people tend to share their successes. Um, so, you know, the, the videos that you see on social media, um, you know, the, the published papers that you see, they're the finished item. They're the, they're the kind of the polished piece that's actually, you know, succeeded and done well. Um, and um, I'm incredibly grateful to Jim uh, for his awesome um, video that he's he put forward this week um, uh, and all the very nice things that he said about us that we potentially don't deserve. Um, but obviously one of the items that he showed that we kind of developed was the bear boxes. Um, so off the back of the success of using it with the, the European Browns um, at ZSL Whipsnade, um, we decided to really push our luck and try them with polar bears. And um, they actually worked, they survived. Um, these were built about a year ago now and they're still being used today um which is absolutely fantastic and we've now tried them with five different species of bear lots and lots of individuals which have worked really really well um however there is one bear one male brown bear um that basically decided he didn't like our work um and did decide to completely shred it to pieces so Again, it's kind of, you know, lots and lots of success, lots and lots of this is really cool. You should try this with your animals. But actually, you know, there's not a sing every sing not everything we do is successful every single time. And again, it's kind of remembering that all of our animals are different. All of our animals have different motivations. And for this male brown bear, he just loves to tear things to shreds. Um, and that's what he made a very good start of doing with the, with the bear box that we made him. So again, kind of remembering that if it doesn't work out, first time if it doesn't work with that individual then actually can we can we kind of take it forward um and again we've got lots of different designs that have started out you know in ways that we thought were going to work fantastically really successfully so these were our brow spinners this was the first kind of prototype that we built um probably five six years ago um for the wallabies at Wayburn worked really nicely didn't spin quite as well as we wanted and they actually look pretty awful um they stand out like a sore thumb in an enclosure so we kind of then decided we want to kind of refine the idea. We wanted to, to make it easier to swap in and out with other feeders. Um, so we kind of developed this as the sort of the secondary um, prototype, um, which again, I mean, this is a fairly grotesque rat, dead rat married around, but uh, when it's being used for browsers, it looks quite pretty with all the, uh, all the branches hanging from it. Um, but again, kind of looking at this, the species that we had used it with previously, this worked absolutely fine. Um, but then when we started talking about some new species that we wanted to try it with, actually, we kind of realized that this particular design has safety concerns with those kind of triangles. If you're talking about, you know, um, deer and antelope species with antlers for, um, antlers and horns, then actually this is potentially a safety concern. Um, we actually also, this was tried out with the main wolves. Um, and again, the kind of thinking about head size, if they kind of jump up and dive for it, would there potentially be an issue there? So again we've kind of designed refined the design one more time just to kind of take out that sort of safety aspect and each time hopefully just make little improvements little changes that really kind of make that difference and, and keep evolving this particular device um similarly this was a prototype that we tried with snow leopards over a year or so ago now probably two years ago now actually um and worked even better than we could possibly hope um the snow leopards were really really into it and the idea is you can change the orientation of the arms so you can have it up high for them jumping kind of mid-level here where they're on the hind legs or kind of set lower down so that they're kind of really pulling on their, on their sort of all fours. Um, so it worked really, really well. But the whole point of this, as well as being enriching for the animals, was that it could be interchangeable for other spinning feeders. And this thing weighs a ton. So it's at least two people to kind of lift it on and off. Um, and even then it's a little bit, if it's being lifted up to height, it's a bit of a safety concern. So again, when we kind of saw the issues with that, it worked perfectly from the animal point of view, but from a keeper logistic point of view, it didn't work quite as well. Um, so we kind of then refined the idea and stripped it back as much as we possibly could um, to make it kind of significantly lighter and, and more user friendly from the keeper point of view, um, even though the original design worked fine from the animal's point of view. Um, and similarly, this was kind of our, our fence mounted feeders. Again, this was probably almost 20 years ago now, this first version. Um, and again, it's big, it's bulky. Um, it sticks out into the kind of the pathway the keepers need to use. So 
the first version really didn't work. We moved on to a, a much simpler version, but unfortunately it looks very reminiscent of a kind of a hangman's noose. Um, so some of the places we kind of built it for, they were like, actually, this is a little bit morbid. We don't, we don't really like having these kind of hanging up and being permanently placed inside the enclosure. Um, so we kind of tweaked it again and we actually put a bungee arm on it to again, get a better behavior out of it, as well as making it look kind of nicer from a public point of view. Um, and then we kind of adapted it again to kind of actually then change it. So again, we could, a bit like the Snow Leopard one, we could change the orientation, bring the arm, you know, up, down, middle kind of thing. Um, but again, the, the look of that, some of the places we worked, they didn't like that. So we've literally just built a new version of this, um, all out of a uh, nice looking chestnut so that it actually blends. I'm trying to find a good bit that shows this sort of the uh, pan out view. Um, that it actually kind of blends in, especially with the tree line behind. Um, it looks nice and naturalistic. Um, it fits into the kind of the background view and it still has the same kind of functionality. So again, we'll probably tweak this design again, but it's this permanent evolution of this kind of idea that we've got the behavior, but we just want to refine it and refine it until it's perfect. Um, and again, so we we decided that based on the destruction of that first that bear that destroyed our initial bear box, we were like, right, we're going to up our game. We're going to create something stronger, more durable that's going to survive the more destructive bears. Um, so we actually kind of stole the idea from Luke Sibbery, who created the Firehose Jack, and we made a jack out of three to three posts. Um, this is literally made out of four three to three posts, so it weighs a ton. It's very very heavy. At least two people need to lift it um, and you can see the polar bear just picked it up no problem at all um the minute we started trying to fill it with food we realized we'd made a mistake and those holes that we'd put in there because the polar bears are only getting dog biscuits they were falling out way too easily um so actually from a toy point of view from a playing point of view the polar bears actually do use it and they enjoy it but from a feeder point of view we already know it hasn't it hasn't hit the mark on this one unfortunately so we need to kind of, again, when we get the next opportunity, we want to kind of refine it. We want to make it um, make it more of a challenge from the feeding point of view um, and just kind of keep going. So, yeah, that hopefully that just kind of opens the gambit a little bit um, and uh, and gives people ideas. But as I say, it's, I think, part of having an honest conversation about enrichment and, and the way that it's evolving is to talk about the things that, you know, haven't worked, aren't going well, you know, any safety concerns and things. And that really kind of then lets us, you know, have that open discussion and, and make sure that we're really doing the best that we can for, for animals. So just that point. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. You got my brain already kind of turning on other ideas for I know animals that I work with and then my park. Um, so we had a bunch of awesome uh, content shared by folks all over the place, um, which is part of Behavior Month. So just so I don't miss anybody, because I have different views on Zoom, but maybe everybody that's on the Zoom that has shared, your, you contributed um, this week, um, can you just put your hand up and we'll just go through um, whoever is here and you can talk a little bit about what you shared and kind of summarize it for everyone. We can start. Christoph, you want to start? Talk about Yes, for sure. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi there. Yeah, thanks, Mark, for your inspirational um, um, presentation. It was really great to see. Um, my name is Christoph. I'm the CEO of Widokind Enrichment. And we are building enrichments based in Berlin, Germany. So this is our headquarter, I would say. Um, we are almost doing the same like Mark uh, here in Germany. Like team building with Byte, but without the, I guess, the corporate uh, team building factor. So, but I like that idea. It's really cool. I like it that you bring people together and so great. Um, yeah, regarding my company, um, we are doing enrichments made of natural uh, materials as well. We try to bring not any plastic objects in, um, yeah, in zoo exhibitions or in zoo, any um, in animal um, enclosures, because I think. Yeah, what I would say is that uh, the enclosures look better and better and more natural and since years now and it will go in the future as well. So for my opinion, I don't think that animals do need do not need any kind of plastic objects. So that's a little bit our um pattern on our USP, I guess, what we like to do. So yeah, that's like we are doing. So it's I'm not really a zoo person. I'm not working in the zoo industry, I'm not a zookeeper or a curator or whatever. But um, yeah, I'm more like the 
the person who has ideas and who brings new ideas on the list. Um, a lot of curators and zoos or curators and zoo persons um, in Germany are working with our company. Um, we are always in, yeah, checking around ideas and things like that. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really a consultant, but um, of course I'm, I do this and I work as a worker as well. So we create and we build all these enrichment items by our own in our little workshop in Berlin. Yeah. It all starts with ideas. We need the ideas. So. That's yeah. Uh, well, let's go over to Jim. And then we'll go to Heather. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, so I uh, put on two videos um, representing ZSL Whipsnade Zoo. So um, on, my job is the Animal Behaviour Management Officer for ZSL. So that's the Zoological Society of London. We've got our two zoos, London and Whipsnade. And um, I work across both of them um, looking after training and enrichment. And um, I've spent a long time working with the elephant team. They went into protected contact in 2017, late 2017, and I started working with them in 2018. And one of the things in the UK we have is the Secretary of State Standards for Modern Zoo Practice, which is a rather long-winded uh, <laughs> kind of document title, but it's all about what governs the zoos in the UK. And um, for a, quite a small region, we've got like 130 BRs and member zoos, and then another 100 odd zoos that aren't uh, members of Biaza, but they all have to adhere to these standards. And um, they're very strict on elephant care, you know, so there's uh, loads of things that the, uh, the team there, have, we've learned together about the evidence-based approach to animal care by the step, by the kind of regulations, if you like, that we have to adhere to, to maintain our zoo license. So it's been actually quite a good thing because it's meant that we've um, added CCTV into the whole area. We do continual monitoring. The keepers are trained in, um, using Zoo Monitor and all these other tools that help them um, with their 24 seven um, care. And it's a very a holistic approach, you know, so the, the guys there, all, the, you know, they, they only look after elephants. So they've got um, a whole team that is dedicated to looking after elephants, which I think is really rare in zoos where you just get one species to look after. So they're very blessed in that way. Um, and they do have um, relatively good resources comparatively. So yeah, um, the video and it's like a six minute video so <clears throat> it just um shows a very very small part of some of their evaluation and they focused on sleep and enrichment provision and the way they've done it i think is really cool um we're, we're currently at zsl trying to review our whole behavior program to create a kind of modular toolkit so that we've got enrichment and the current sort of enrichment um licensing requirements which is we have to evaluate we have to go through the process as mark said there with, with the framework for goal setting and in the meantime, we're also trying to bring in um, all of the other elements of behaviour that's um, that's part of that that kind of remit. So things like welfare assessments and um, acclimatisation for animals, introductions uh, and nutrition, all those things that we feel are part of a bigger behaviour management package. And, um, yeah, we're kind of in the early stage of that. And one of the things that we've been doing is working with um, uh, Jessica and Louisa at San Diego to try and bring in some of their experiences of, of the Enriched Experiences program, which I found fascinating, particularly that behavior workflow process where they focus on the behavioral outputs and then work their way back to the kind of traditional enrichment inputs that we put in. And so um, part of our process of working towards that has involved um, very heavily Mark and Chris, um, because what we've been trying to do is to look at behavior output first. And so obviously some of those things are you know, specific um, cooperative feeding for carnivores like uh, African wild dogs, um, for things like looking at the way aardvarks feed and rather than just thinking, you know, continually thinking about the tongue use, which is a, an important part of that complex tongue, tongue use is important, but also thinking about them standing up and digging out of a termite mound. And, um, and so we basically come up with these behavioural outputs and think, well, what, what, how can we make this work while getting funding and making it engaging for visitors. And then we go, there you go, Mark, you deal with that. And they come up with the uh, solution. So um, what you said before, some of which, you know, what I said about your, your and Chris's work, some of which you don't deserve, you deserve all of it and more. What you've done for us at uh, Whipsnade Zoo, particularly this year, um, the last year and a half has been nothing short of, you know, totally transformational. So we're incredibly grateful to your creativity and expertise. And, you know, we pay for it. 
but we don't pay very much. And I don't want to tell tell you that, but it's true. <laughs> Comparative, we were asking our in-house, um, you know, uh, we have an in-house maintenance company that we pay, you know, and if we if I was to ask them to build the sort of A, they wouldn't have a clue because they're not animal people, and B, well, it would cost triple. But you know, I'm really reluctant to say that in front of Mark because then it might the next invoice that comes in might be, you know. Uh, I yeah, but I think what I feel like we've done as well is that we've created a collaborative effort because Mark and I worked together with Biaza with the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquaria, and that was both of us volunteering our time, right, to do these things. So, um, so I feel like we've come at it from an angle of, yeah, it's sort of, you know, I know you're running a business, but genuinely it doesn't feel like that. It feels like you're just doing it for the animals, trying to get some you know, be be inspiring and creative and then take some of that inspiration back to your business, if you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah, and um, <clears throat> the video, it shows aardvarks, wild dogs, bears and cheetahs. So if you haven't seen it, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend it. I, I did work really hard on it because I wanted to make sure that it reflected well what um, what Mark and Chris have, have offered to us and also the work of the particularly the predator team at which they do that look after those animals. So, yeah, that's uh, that's our content. Sorry, I was muted. Um, awesome. And Mark, you can make much more money. That's one of the things I learned. Um, Don't tell him that. <laughs> uh, let's go over to Heather. Hello, I'm very happy to join y'all. I'm Heather. I'm representing the Oklahoma City uh, Zoo and Botanical Gardens, and I'm in our behavioral husbandry department, and we're under a larger umbrella that's conservation, research, and education. Um, so our department oversees the behavior, welfare, enrichment, and training initiatives throughout the zoo, um, but we do a lot of data collection, and I think that's where I'm fortunate that I can gain most of my design ideas, um, not just with collaborating with the teams, but because I'm watching their animals for hours and hours on end and really seeing how they're utilizing the habitat and what influence they have. Um, and that's kind of what was covered in our presentation was our enrichment program here at the zoo, what our goals are, um, and then highlighting one of our examples with our giraffe, um, which uh, I have seen y'all's posts and gathered some ideas and adapted it to our zoo. So thank y'all for the content that you guys were putting out there. Really appreciate that. Um, but we are definitely looking to see how we can remove keeper influence out of the enrichment and really have the animals pay attention and explore their environment and get influence from their environment um, and then act accordingly to then get the, the output. Uh, hopefully it's something that is reinforcing that they'll keep doing it over again. Uh, but that's something that we're really seeking to continue and we're looking into technology um, to kind of help push that through. But uh, really enjoyed being able to collaborate with the animal care teams and create things that, and it's been mentioned here already, that are dynamic and interchangeable. So they have more options uh, to be able to continue challenging the animals uh, with their enrichment programs. Awesome. Okay. Just so I don't make, I want to make sure I don't miss anyone um, that has contributed. Is there anybody else that has contributed to content? I'm looking at everybody now. I don't think so. Um, so um, one thing I should, probably should have said at the very beginning um, that I forgot to, but is that we do record these. And um, we, as we did with last week's, we plan to then uh, have our recordings, uh, whatever discussion happens, whatever questions happen, um, available to everyone later as well. So um, cooperative care is out it's on the YouTube channel and we'll do the same with uh, this week's for enrichment. Um, but does anyone so far have any questions or just other topics you wanna discuss regarding enrichment? I can talk, I like to talk. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to have like, the facilitator had on today. Um, but I definitely, my brain starts going and I definitely have some, a couple things I wanna throw out there to the enrichment experts that just spoke, but anybody else out there on the Zoom. So if you do throw your hand up and we can, we can throw, um, or we can do new ideas um, and questions as they arise. But one thing I wanted to see what everybody thought, um, you know, from, my time in our field, I've definitely seen an evolution of enrichment. But like when we talked about 
uh, when we were developing Behavior Month this year, we were coming up with our topics and I forget who, I think Ellie came up with Evolution of Enrichment, which was awesome. Uh, but a cool thing is that, um, you know, like we all had different ideas of what the evolution of enrichment is. My brain went to um, just from the history of it, right? Like when I first got into our field, it definitely was, you know, enrichment is toys and that was pretty much it. Um, and so I've seen that change a lot um, to, you know, goal-based and behavior-based enrichment as it should be. Um, but one thing, you know, I do still see, and I'm curious if everybody else does too, especially in other parts of the world, there still is, there seems to be facilities and teams and individuals that really get it. And then the opposite, there's it's kind of like polar opposites. Um, so how much of the, I don't know what we call it, but you know, the paper mache making, you know, a box that looks like a zebra um, themed crafty enrichment, how much of that do you see still out there? And I guess the second part I would want to ask you guys is um, how do you sell, change the minds, um, sell it to, to do goal-based, behavior-based enrichment rather than just arts and crafts? Anybody can run with that because I know you guys know way more about it than I do. I can start if you don't mind. Yeah, um, good. Uh, so we here are uh, part of our enrichment program is it has to be naturalistic if it's on guest view um, to be able to help with the interpretation of what's going on and uh, for it to, to look appropriate. Um, so we have special events like today. Uh, we're actually having our Chomp and Stomp event. So that's when cardboard and certain theme things are approved to go out. How, uh, but going off of that, I think the, the goal base, we just had to start applying it. And it was through our documentation, actually, that that was how we were going to evaluate it was by having a goal behavior in mind and having that front loaded versus having the item. So I think that that helped in changing the culture and the mindset. Um, it's still a work in progress. And our caretakers, managers are definitely giving us feedback on how to improve and evolve that. Data, proof. Yes. <laughs> Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you want to go first? I would like to join this. Uh, small. Head of that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, since I'm working in the industries, it's maybe three years now. A lot of things have changed in Germany as well regarding enrichment programs. So I think I'm totally agree what Heather just said that the enrichment or our our clients, which are more than 20 zoos in Germany at the moment, um, I often say to me, it must look really natural enrichment looking like. So it's not good if we bring a yellow plastic bottle inside a really modern and expensive new enclosure. So that's definitely a topic which changed. I would say, or from my opinion is, or what I have heard from other curators or other zoo people is that um, a lot of change regarding this have already been made. So we are totally in some kind of uh, transformation at the moment. So the whole industry is a little bit of a transformation. And of course, we have all these people who are maybe still are critic about or critical voices about zoo, isn't it? So I guess we have it all over the world. So we need to bring a new um yeah a new guideline even in enrichment as well and of course what i've learned is that um enrichment must be uh, usable for both sides so for the animals of course and for zookeepers so it doesn't bring any effect if enrichment um is destroyed after seconds and on the other hand it doesn't bring any effect if um it's not cleanable or it's not easy to use for the work for the workers for the zookeepers so yeah, there are both sides we need to talk about and think about. Yeah. I think Mark and Jim both earlier wanted to jump in. I'm gonna Mark, you go first, mate. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, um cheers, Jim. Um I think I think there's lots of different components to the question. I think the 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 straight answer is I still see a lot of you know, and you still see it on social media, like people posting going, oh, you know, the simple stuff's always the best with cardboard boxes and 
like one of the big kind of emphasis I tend to put on some of the talks that I do is, you know, the cardboard box is not the kind of the be all and end all of the enrichment program. And actually there's, there's simple things are good and actually slightly disagree that actually a couple of seconds of enrichment is still an enrichment experience. And I think that's still valuable as part of a wider program. So simple destructible stuff, as long as it's, you know, made by members of the public, for example, it's not taking any keeper time and it's allowing keepers to work on the more, the more challenging things that are going to be more long-term use. They're, they're still part of the program. And I think they're still a, a big part of the program for a lot of people, but it's making sure that it's not the emphasis of the program and it's not just the throwaway stuff I think is, is kind of critical. I, I kind of, uh, I'm I'm on the other end of it from the whole the naturalistic thing. I have a lot of people talking to me about the fact that they're only allowed to use naturalistic stuff and how limiting that is for them and how hard it is and how they're not given the budget to back that up. So one zookeeper I was talking to used to have 20 different enrichment items that they used for their bears quite happily. And then their zoo went no, naturalistic enrichment only. And that list went down to one. Oh, bear species that needs stimulation that needs to be able to express these behaviors and it was an arbitrary decision to go no it has to look natural because it's better for the public the bear was really enjoying its 20 items and suddenly it's got one that's being used repeatedly and is no longer being valuably used because it's being overused and actually especially if those other 18 items are now being used off show because hopefully if it's only naturalistic on show you can still use the artificial stuff behind the scenes then that's that's 18 times that animals being enriched the public never gets to see so mm -hmm. now they're focusing out on seeing this very cool behavior so i i i'm actually kind of there is definitely some data that suggests that the naturalistic stuff can be important from an education point of view but there is equally some stuff that says actually it doesn't matter the public is perfectly happy to see a bright pink rock in a polar bear exhibit and they will still say your animal's got good welfare and they will still support your program and they'll still come visit your zoo. They might not say it looks natural, but actually from the animal's point of view, from the welfare point of view, do we care? For me, right. you know. Jim. Yeah, a couple of things um, to pick up there. Yeah, um, at ZSL we had a, we, I think it was oh, going back a few years now, we had a, um, a particular senior manager that was really not interested and uh, not in, into the unnaturalistic enrichment stuff that was being used and some of it was really functional so for example we were we had slow feeders for the pygmy hippos that were you know really you know essentially quite cheap and cheerful so it was roped with with uh, dustbin lids together so it really slowed down that foraging and made them reach up for it as well um and you know there was this feeling that because it was unnaturalistic, it was wrong. And so what we had to do was to kind of write um, write an entire new policy statement saying what we felt we needed to do to make it work. Because obviously he's the boss, so we need to make that work, right? We can't just say, this is ridiculous, we're going on strike because of a bin lid in the enclosure. So we, um, we looked at it and we actually thought, you know what, the problem here is that a lot of this stuff that was being used wasn't that functional. It was just boomer balls left in the enclosure for weeks on end that had absolutely no value whatsoever. And um, and so we tried to make sure that um, the if something was going into the enclosure, um, we made sure it was had it had it was always evaluated. So we have a rapid assessment model that we can use. It's just a really simple thing for the keepers to fill in, and it shows whether this this stuff is actually having any value. So it's not real heavy duty data collection, which would be awesome, obviously, if we were doing projects and everything, but we have a, a system whereby every new enrichment um, technique or device has to be assessed by the keeper that puts it in, obviously for safety, but then also for the behavioral output. <clears throat> and um, and then we would make sure that it was removed. If it was unnaturalistic, it was removed after the animal stopped using it. If it was a category one animal that we couldn't go back in with, then obviously the caveat was that it would be the following day when servicing uh, permits but what we didn't want to do and we felt we felt like this you know as well is we don't want stuff just sitting in the enclosures forever because it's you know just has absolutely no value um and then um and then the other part of it is that we have a major problem um i don't know whether this is the same in the states or in other um, regions but um how can i put this diplomatically people that like marketing people 
they really like the Christmas presents and the Easter egg hunt and all those sort of things. So we're constantly doing these things that are basically saying, look at our cool animals um, opening Christmas presents. And um, and the guys, and this is where the guys in the elephant team have basically just said, well, we've got to get away from that part of it. You know, the unnaturalistic stuff that the Mark's talking about for the bears, that clearly serves an incredibly valuable purpose for those individuals. But the Christmas presents, that is literally, that is all over social media. You know, we're really guilty of it. And um, and so, yeah, the elephant team, um, they kind of approached the uh, the press team and said, we shouldn't be doing this because it doesn't send the right messages out about what we're trying to do with elephants. And I say the same about gorillas. And, you know, maybe eventually we'll get to a point where we should be thinking about it for everything, even a meerkat. How many times do I see meerkats with Easter eggs and, um, you know, Christmas presents? And it's like, I'm so bored of it. But uh, <laughs> but that's me. Um, you know, it, it, you, you talk to the press, press office, they're like, yeah, but then we get thousands and thousands of people watching those videos. They're so popular. So where's the balance there? And so what we want to try and do is engage our commercial teams and say, come on, let's be a bit more creative here. And rather than it being it's this elephant's birthday, so he's got a birthday cake or present or whatever, or it's a lollipop in the summer again, you know, we want to try and make sure that at that level we're 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 reaching internally because otherwise these things keep getting recycled. These ideas keep getting recycled. It's fine to do it. It's brilliant. The zoos love it. Put it on TikTok. You know, we're being tasked with winning the internet at the moment. So that's like, you know, what even is that? But, you know, that's one of the things that we've, um, we've been tasked with, you know? So yeah, it's a really, um, I think it's a great question about it. And, um, and I think we've got a very long way to go to get it right. Yeah, I agree. And, and you kind of hit, Right, hit it right on the head what I what I was asking because um, I, I just see a lot of that. I know I've worked at places and I'm sure most people have that that is a push because it does get views. So I think, you know, finding new ways to use real enrichment in 2023 that can still maybe get the same amount of views or hits or reach um, is an important part uh, of moving forward. Chris, um, he is actually ended up on the call, but oh, I lost him. He had a, there we go. Um, he put in the chat, uh, Jim mentioned enriched experiences. Is anyone on the call pursuing that? And what does that look like for your zoo? Well, I, I can pick up on that um, now. We basically, that's the, um, the, the program that the guys at San Diego developed. Um, I'm pretty sure they've talked about it during one of your ABMA behavior months or conferences or whatever um but i saw jessica doing a talk about it and it's really interesting and it is that kind of trying to get away from that really input driven enrichment program where and we've been, you know again we, we're very very guilty of this at um or have been at zsl which is enrichment time is 1 30 so we go and get the thing we give it to the animal and we tick a box and walk away and that's um and that's sort of that traditional i think that's where Enrichment started out brilliantly and then got to that point. And now I think from the work of people like Mark and Chris and Heather, you, you know, you're everyone seeing a totally different pathway. But I think what San Diego done has sort of really created a really interesting program. And, um, and it's something that you can easily adapt for your own collection. So the San Diego model wouldn't work for ZSL because it's just we're very, very different institutions. But what we've done is we've had a series of meetings with them We've um, used it, almost used their exact workflow process and the enriched experience part of it is essentially sort of um, almost operant conditioning, really. It's looking at um, instead of it being a person asking for a behavior, it's the environment, environmental stimulus that um, elicits or evokes the behavior. And then gradually over time, the animal gets better at it. And the example they use quite frequently is like with elephants digging and using a, a, a scent of cinnamon over the area where they're supposed to dig. And gradually they learn that smell means that they dig in that area. Gradually they increase the amount of places they have to dig, but with less stimulus, you know, less discriminative stimulus there. And eventually it's just the smell of cinnamon means go and dig. And I think those sort of things are really exciting and interesting. And we're what we're doing as part of our modular toolkit thing at ZSL is including the behavior workflow and then those enriched experiences almost as separate things because we feel that we're so far behind in terms of our enrichment program that we need to get what we're doing now right first. In other words, we need to properly get um, get away from that 
discreet goal of enrichment, you know, set a one thirty enrichment tick thing. Try and uh, try and get towards goal, you know, the proper goal setting, behavioural output focused um, enrichment, but still carrying on with our evaluation because that's part of our licensing agreement. But then while we're doing that, evolve gradually towards this full on behaviour workflow and enriched experiences. Because ultimately, when you talk to the guys at San Diego, they want to, they, they, they almost, and I think, you know, this is, I think it's fair, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but it's almost to sort of move away from the, the fully input focused thing and just have behaviours that the animals we know they have to do and have the hardware and infrastructure in place to allow keepers to do it on a daily basis. So everything they need to do daily, they do. And um, we did a, a study to kind of almost see whether that's working, whether, whether it could work, et cetera. So we did it with a carpet and we, we isolated two behaviours, drinking and complex tongue use. And we used those behaviours and created a series of inputs with the context, you know, the physical adaptations, the con contexts that they, they would do them in the wild. And then we would figure out how to do it in in, uh, in the zoo. And what we found is we increased complex tongue use by something like twenty five percent. I don't I've got we've, we've got a report on it, and I don't want to just pluck numbers out of the air, but it was a significant, statistically significant increase in complex tongue use. And the way it was done was rather than it, it, before we'd have got um, two hanging baskets and stuck them together and put some brows in and given it to them at one thirty, you know, twice a week or once every week as enrichment. Now they're fed solely in those hanging baskets for one day. And then the next day they have a different form of um, uh, enriched feeding. And then the next day something different. And then it just goes in a rotation. So there isn't that feeling of I've got to do my enrichment at one thirty for complex tongue use, this particular behavior, because we know we're going to hit it with the way that we feed them. And, uh, and so it kind of moves away. And then the drinking one, they, their examples with wallabies. And how many times do you actually think, how does an animal find its water resources in the wild. I've ne I don't think I've ever really thought about it, if I'm honest. I'm gonna, you know, maybe um, you think about it with tropical birds and, and taking water out of bromeliads in, in the rainforest, but have you ever thought about how an acarpi finds its water and drinks? And it certainly isn't in a, in a trough this high off the ground. And what we found is that there was a very, there was a repetitive behavior they did and it looked like drinking, but it wasn't. They were just sort of doing this lapping of water. And we think it's because they weren't getting enough of their complex tongue use. So they were doing this repetitive behavior to try and meet that behavioral need. So by doing the hanging baskets and then by adding a, um, a drip in water, so a little hose that's sprinkled down into trays on the ground, and they started doing a new behavior of drinking on the ground and, and then drinking off their body. So instead of, which is two of the ways they would find food, uh, water in the wild, they stopped using the troughs and stopped doing that rep repetitive behavior completely. And so these are the, I think that, I, I, you know, it's difficult to speak on the behalf of another organisation, but I, just on their behalf, I'd like to say thanks very much for the for the inspiration, and uh, hopefully that answers Chris Chris's question. Is that we're doing something, we're doing our own version of it, and we're going to try and share that, particularly with our colleagues in San Diego, because they've just helped us so much. I mean, they've given us so much of their time. They've done three workflows with our teams, you know, other side of the planet, more or less, aren't they? So you know, yes. Yeah. Um, Hopefully that gives Chris a bit of an insight of what we've done at ZSL. Yeah. I, does anybody, I'm just checking the chat here. Um, does anybody else here on the call have any other input on that, on the enriched experiences? I really um, like that example. Um, and at the Omaha Zoo, uh, the her curator wanted us to start uh, instead of like, because we have a certain set of uh, amount of enrichment we have to give per week like there's certain constraints around that that we have to enrich every single day or every animal every single day um and so it was difficult and that's when we found more input driven enrichment versus goal based because we were trying to meet the goal of giving enrichment in a day um but to answer your question for enriched experience is going off of that so our uh Herb Curator came up with an idea of building a husbandry calendar. So it was actually outcome-based husbandry that we built in to have these experiences. So seasonally, these were closed systems. So they were enclosures that we could change the lighting, the humidity, uh, level of water. And we would look up the season of what some of these reptiles would go through. And then 
each season we had a calendar of we would have these temperature ranges, this these humidity ranges, and even the food source. Like in spring, we wouldn't have adult crickets; we would have pinhead crickets. Yeah. Um, so even how and what we were offering uh, was ex- changing the experiences for the animals, and we saw really good results. The only thing I wish we did was a study and really evaluated how that impacted, at least through data. We saw it anecdotally, but we did see increased breeding uh, from our animals and engagement with their environment from that. That's awesome. Um, just to, there's a couple more people um, on the call. So if anybody does want to chime in or ask a question or give their uh, their experiences, just raise your hand and or just start talking. Uh, cool. So, well, so um, we are almost to our hour. One thing I wanted to ask everybody on here in, in light of evolution of enrichment, blue sky, what is the next part of the evolution? Where do we, where should enrichment programs go from here? It's kind of a big question, but you know, where are we going? I was really interested in what Heather said before about the um, oh. technology. And how that would be um, something because I think I think of that with training programs as well is how we're going to be going more remote. And I think you did, you said about trying to reduce the influence of keepers in that program. That's so key, isn't it? <clears throat> That's just one part. I mean, obviously the you know the gradually moving away from having to put enrichment in because the enclosures are so bloody brilliant, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I really like that about technology and how that's going to. Um, so I'd be more interested to see what um, you guys are up to over there and uh, how we can bring that in. But I think that's that's going to be quite a long process, isn't it? A lot of skill building on our end. That's something that I don't have a background in. Um, and so we're working with, uh, with our engineering school right now. Um, and hopefully they'll teach us something of, of programming and, and sensor based, really. So if the animal moves in a certain area or behaves or does climbs, you know, what, whatever it may be that it's going to trigger something. Um, but it, and like what you were saying, it's, it's very training based as well. Cause we want to have the cues out there in the environment to kind of lead to what the animal wants to do or move towards that. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely update everyone. We're still very new in that process. Behavior month, 2024. <laughs> That'll be our goal. I think that's a really good point though, because, um, you know, another kind of evolution that I've seen, at least from my personal experiences, is it was, you know, enrichment and training were very siloed. Um, but really, I mean, they're all one and the same as a, as a whole behavior modification program or just behavior management program. Um, they should be used in tandem. Um, one doesn't replace the other entirely. And right, enrichment is training and training is enrichment. I see head shaking. Yes. So um, I, I've seen that changing. And I, personally, I hope that continues to, to kind of be seen um, throughout. I'm checking chat again. Does anybody else have anything to add? I was going to say, thoughts? I, yeah, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think, yeah, the, the role of tech and stuff. And, and again, like kind of that having that environment a lot of the stuff that we have to do is kind of you know remedial we're putting stuff in because it wasn't kind of built into the the infrastructure in the first place and where we've had the opportunity to kind of build enclosures from scratch we've tried to make sure that there's lots of enrichment built in so that you know it makes it easy for the keepers it makes it easy to change and keep it dynamic and then and then those simple things really are just little bits of extra just to kind of you know really create a full a full program the the thing that I was kind of smiling about when like Jim and Heather were talking about kind of the the enriched experience, but also like the, you know, the the animal climbs and therefore something happens. The from a history point of view, like how Markowitz was doing that back in the 80s, 
like the tiger claws the tree and it stimulates a hunting experience over here that you know so but everybody in the 80s was like throwing stones at him and saying you know this isn't naturalistic and you know you're you're making these animals do these things that they shouldn't be doing so it's kind of it's it is an evolution but in some ways it's very cyclical um which isn't a bad thing i think you know if we look back at our history and go actually some of the stuff that hal was doing you know back then like we we we've actually literally when we built a lemur enclosure last year we took the inspiration from some of the stuff that he was doing with the kind of the public engagement stuff and and built it in because we just you know there are some very cool ideas there that actually yeah with the tech that we've got nowadays would be very very easy um you know san francisco zoo had this amazing system built into its leopard enclosure where there was a speaker system a motion sensor set up throughout the entire habitat the leopard would basically hear a bird call and if she chose to react, she didn't have to react, but if she chose to react by going to the speaker at a set time, she would trigger the motion sensor, which would then trigger a series of sounds and motion sensors around the exhibit. If she followed that within a certain time pattern, there would be a food reward at the end. And she learned, you know, if I bounce on this branch, I don't have to go all the way over to where the bird sound is because it will actually, that will knock the motion sensor and trigger it over there. And like we're now we're talking to a university about actually trying to do that with webcams because now the camera tech you can you can do that without motion sensors it's a lot cheaper but i mean that that is incredible and i've never ever seen it repeated i, I speak to people from san francisco zoo who don't even know this stuff existed don't know what happened to it why it got stopped but it was used successfully for a year and then it just disappeared so again i think if we're going to keep evolving we actually should look back at some of this stuff that's been done some of these things that have been tried as one-offs and go why haven't they been taken forward why why did they stop and now with the tech that we've got and now with the knowledge that we've got can we actually kind of revisit some of these things and go yeah, this is pretty cool we can we can do this now and we can do it easily and we can do it cheaply and we can do it reliably so that it becomes consistent and it's not just this awesome idea that disappears into the ether that is really interesting i feel like Mark, you should come to ABMA and do a presentation on all the old ideas that we should reevaluate, uh, or a workshop. We, I'll well, be well, yeah, twenty twenty four. Yeah, come on over. Um, mm -hmm. And I agree, Jim. We need video. I want to see that video too. Um, all right. So, uh, any other final thoughts from anyone or questions? Cool. Well. Thank you all um, for participating in all the different ways. Um, next week is, well, to be fair, welfare around the world is not over quite yet because it's Friday. We still have a couple more days um, on our ABMA social media page, namely Facebook. So keep an eye out on there uh, for more enrichment this week. But um, next week is the human animal connection, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, so I'm excited about that week too. We'll have another Zoom. Um, I cannot remember the time right now, but it will be on Friday. Um, and again, if anybody uh, has any feedback for us on how we can uh, make Zoom even cooler, reach more people, let us know. Um, even if you're watching this recorded uh, later, uh, after we, we end this one, it'll be up on our YouTube page. So just reach out to us. You can find uh, all of our contact info on the, the board member contact info on um, the ABMA website. And I believe um, if any of you want to put any of your uh, contact info you would like into the chat uh, for those that are here. Sorry, I almost froze. I didn't freeze. Uh, you can do that as well. But uh, again, thank you all for joining us for the evolution of enrichment. Until next week. Bye, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks. All right. So.